Hi folks, welcome to the last part of chapter 16, part 3, uh, where we'll be talking all about flooding. And this is a picture here of downtown Houston after the uh, uh, hurricane that hit that area a couple years ago. You can see all the water sitting in there. All right. uh, flooding, uh, remember when I told you when we were talking, no matter what natural disaster we're talking, whatever has to do with water is always the deadliest. Well, flooding is the wateriest -y and the deadliest -y of the the natural disasters, right? Is the number one natural disaster in terms of loss of human life. Right? Of course, it's natural phenomenon. It's a beneficial phenomenon. It replaces nutrients, soil moisture, all that good stuff. But as we start to build up more and more urbanization, more and more development, we start to see more frequent and larger flooding occurring in areas. And we'll talk about why that is um, in just a little bit here. But again, as you see population growth and urbanization, this increases the risk and probability of flooding in a given area. Right? So flooding can occur during heavy rain or extensive snow melts, when the ground is already saturated, when that cup is full, you can't fit any more water into it, right? There's not, I mean, the only way the place the water has to go uh, is over the surface. Right? Or of course, when the rainfall exceeds the infiltration capacity of the ground and the excess water runs off uh, the surface. The severity of a flood has to both to do with not only the volume of water, but the rate at which that water enters the stream system. The higher the volume, the faster the rate, the more severe the flooding. And again, that rate of surface runoff, the water that runs off the surface into streams, is related to the infiltration capacity of the ground. When the infiltration capacity is had the ability of the ground to absorb uh, the water, the rain, uh, uh, the snow melt itself, right? This is, a, a, again, a function of the intensity and duration of the rainfall. Uh, if it's coming too fast, it's not able to absorb in the ground quick enough. A lot more becomes overland flow or surface runoff, right? Or if the duration, you know, rain and for weeks, right? The ground is already saturated, it's full, uh, and then the excess water is going to become surface runoff, right? And that again is saturation of soils. This includes not only uh, the, uh, you know, whether or not it's been raining and the, and the soil is full, but uh, includes also frozen ground. In the winter, uh, it's impossible almost for water to, to soak through frozen ground, so you get a lot more surface runoff. Urbanization as well, right? I mean, if you think about it, cement doesn't allow for a lot of infiltration capacity, almost none at all. So wherever you have cement or or pavement or 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 driveway or road uh you know or building uh any rain that falls on that area you know naturally that would have been a nice grassed soiled area that would have been able to absorb a lot of this excess water but now all that water becomes surface runoff all of it becomes surface runoff because virtually none of it can soak into the ground right Slope plays also uh, an important role. The steeper the slope, the more is going to run off the surface, the less is going to have chance to soak into the ground. Vegetation cover as well. Not only do plants uh, protect kind of like an umbrella, uh, the ground from be hitting, being hit directly by the raindrops and causing excess erosion, uh, but the plants themselves have, you know, a, a, a need for water and they're going to absorb some of that water as well and, uh, and help to take up some of that excess water. But it, for all of it, basically what the, what it runs down to is the faster the surface runoff, for whatever reason, the higher the probability of severe floods. And as we see with urbanization, the more we build, the more water gets flushed into a stream system. So here's an example just from around my parking lot in my townhouse complex here. They uh, repaved the, the road or our, our parking lot a couple years ago. So I took the opportunity to uh, show this infiltration capacity. This is after a decent rainstorm about an hour later. You notice on the natural grass areas, it's all soaked in. But here on the brand new 
asphalt, of course, none of it has soaked in. And just to show you as well, this isn't asphalt. This is this is bare dirt uh, that they, uh, you know, they tore up the old asphalt and this is just bare dirt underneath, but they have to compact it. And so you don't have settling issues when you lay the asphalt. So this compacted ground is essentially, you know, uh, we've squished out, you know, if soil is about half, half, uh, half space and about half stuff it's not the stuff that we squished it's the space that we squished out when we compacted the soil down and you can see this stuff has about as low infiltration capacity as the asphalt itself a couple different types of floods to talk about the first one are are called upland floods aka flash floods Right. These you see in in in, you know, kind of moderate to high relief areas. In other words, mountainous areas coming just out of mountain canyons. They're powerful. They come quick with little or no warning. They come, they take you, your cats and your dogs, flush you down the canyon and then they're gone. Right. Again, they happen in areas of moderate to high relief. They have uh, generally a, you know, relatively small area of impact in a short duration. Usually they come, they go. And they're done right this is a um a picture from a flash flood in 2013 out in colorado you can see how this flash flood just ate this road base out uh from from underneath uh and caused these cars to fall into into the road right now around here we do not have flash floods we have what we call lowland floods and here's a picture of a lowland flood in grand rapids this is the 2013 flood that we had a 30-year flood or so we'll talk about what that means in just a few minutes but this is downtown grand rapids all right and these floods are generally longer in duration affect much larger areas and have it's because the rivers we're dealing with have much larger drainage basins of these these mountain streams that that uh, the, the flash flooding occurs on right so we're dealing with a lot larger volume of water and again remember you know here we have nice meandering streams big wide flood plains big wide river valleys and once the flood happens, once it comes out of the channel, it's got to spread out over that floodplain before it starts to rise. So a rise of one foot, two foot, three foot is dealing with an incredible volume of water. And this is generally not the, the you know, the results, like often flash floods, the result of, you know, one kind of real big intense or, or you know, short kind of duration rainstorm. Uh, these are generally the result of these lowland floods long air uh, times of extensive rainfall uh, regional snow melts and that's again what we saw in 2013 and then again in 2018 when we had again another uh, 30 year flood so again for any floods i know this is lowland floods but uh you know it'll inundate whatever floodplain is adjacent to the river channel uh in high mountainous areas that's not much because you have just those steep v-shaped canyons the only place the water has to go is up right but here we have big broad floodplains and and they'll have time to spread out over these big floodplains and then slowly rise right uh a flood is said to crest when it meets, reaches its maximum stage or its maximum elevation, its maximum height, right? Stage just means in basically a fancy word for a stick in the river that's got tick marks on it that tells you how high the water is. But, you know, they're more complicated than that. But uh, that's essentially just the basics, right? The higher the stage, right, the larger the flood. And here are a couple flood hydrographs and hydrographs are used to study potential flood characteristics for streams and we see two different ones here uh, and both of them plot a streams discharge uh, or volume or elevation or stage over time or those can all be related so here is time here is discharge right when we see these red lines represent flood stage uh upland and lowland floods as you might expect have completely different curves and and what we see here this sharp right coming flooding going right this is this is an upland or a flash flood and here the time would be in you know hours maybe representing you know a couple days maximum or a full day or something on this on this uh um, uh, on a hydrograph here. But as you see, as you know, a big rain event, say up in the mountains, all that water rushes down the canyon, takes you, cat dogs, and all your squirrels, right? And then it goes, right? Here's what we see around here. Here's a flood hydrograph for a very typical 
lowland flood, the kinds we experience around here, like on our Grand River. And here, the big difference, this time is not in hours, this time is in days, maybe representing a span of almost two weeks here. And here you'll have extensive, again, regional snowmelt. It was not just one big rain event like it would be with a flash flood. You get extensive regional snowmelt, prolonged rain events, right? And that slowly goes up once we reach flood stage. It's going to take days before we crest right reach that peak of the flood and then we'll slowly start to go down and just to show you here's from 2018 this is the grand river at grand rapids i believe it's somewhere around the sixth street bridge so here is stage this is again that stick in the river you know just measuring how high the water is and that can be related to elevation right here they also also list flow or discharge if you will right in thousands of cubic feet per second uh, and what we can see is here's here's you know the, the flood stage here's in uh, this is where it's in its river channel, right? And then here's where it reaches flood stage. But if you remember back to 2018, uh, rain stopped somewhere around Sunday. So it really, it wasn't even raining when we went into flood stage. It takes a while for all this water to travel uh, overland through the ground, right? Uh, just subsurface uh, and through these smaller tributaries into major tributaries and then finally into the Grand River. And, and then we see it finally Wednesday or, or Tuesday evening, it goes into flood stage, right? And then here's next Tuesday, it's still in flood stage. It isn't until that next Saturday that it reaches its, its crest or its maximum height right and again rain events stopped you know way back here so this represents several weeks right Wednesday so it goes out Tuesday night here's the next here's one week and we can see we're not even back in to uh, the, the, the channel again yet so the flood is still occurring so it was out of its banks for almost two weeks right when we we had that very last flood now just a note about what we call big floods and I mentioned something you know before we said we had a uh, uh, 30 year flood on Grand Rapids or on, on the Grand River, both in 2013 and 2018. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's obviously not 30 years apart. These are based on basically historical records. And what we're really, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, 30 year floods, there's one year's floods, there's 50 year floods. When you get up to the big, big floods, you're talking 100 year or 500 year floods. And these are, again, based on the historic record, based on the flooding history of that river. So for the Grand River, there's its own, you know, uh, flooding history and it has its own calculations as to what a 30 year, a 100 year, a 500 year flood, right? And these are done per river. You can't take, say, the Mississippi River or the Kalamazoo River and use that data on the Grand River. You have to be done per year. And again, basically it is just a statistics thing, right? A one in a 100 year flood, right? It's statistically, it happens once only every hundred years, but every year you have a one in a hundred chance of it happening, or a 500 year flood, one in a 500 chance of it happening. One 30 year flood is a, a one in 30 chance of that happening. But there's, you know, important to remember that there's no meteorological or statistical law saying you can't have back to back large floods, back to back hundred year floods, or back to back. Uh, you know, 30 year floods or even 30 year floods five years apart, which we saw here in West Michigan, right? The probability in any given year, again, remember, is the same. So it is possible to have back to back 100 year floods, although it would be highly unlikely. So here's a picture of New Orleans after Katrina. You can see how all this water is just standing there. This is after the levees broke, of course, right? And this is a, a part of the, the modification that we've been making to our river systems, right? And the modifying the river systems and all the additional urbanization has not only altered how much water but how fast the water is coming into the system. So now we've got a lot more water coming into the system a lot faster, right? And this can cause larger floods, flooding above the historic floodplain level, so larger volumes of water coming in faster, making larger and larger floods, right? And here's an example for a river, I think this is just a, I'm not sure which river this is, but uh, before flooding, we're talking about the same rain event here, so we're holding, uh, 
you know, the same volume of water entering the system at the same time. What we see is beforehand, that wouldn't even have caused a flood stage. It would not have come out of the, the channel of the river, and its crest would have been much later. Right? But after urbanization, after all the cement is down and all the roads have been built and all the buildings have been built, and now instead of that water soaking into the ground, it is rushing off the surface, becomes additional surface runoff, and it's entering the system much faster because it doesn't have to run through the ground and all that. It just It runs right off the cement into the, the rivers and streams. And now we see not only with that same volume entering at the same rate now cause a flooding event, but it causes that flooding event, the crest, to occur much sooner than it would have previously. Again, flooding is more frequent and more severe after urbanization. Flood mitigation, right? So how do we control flooding? Well, one thing we can do is put a dam in, right? This is a volume and rate control. Put in a dam, you have the ability to store some extra surface runoff, and you can let that out at a, a measured rate. Retaining basins, the same thing, volume and rate control. The uh, retaining basins, however, are usually done on an individual property type type area. So there's several of them around Grand Valley's campus. If you go to a, you know, a mall, there's to be a couple of them around the mall. The idea is to, to store some, again, excess surface runoff uh, and then release it you know, at a, a measured rate into the, uh, the system. Right. Flood walls, this is just a barrier or protection. Right. And then the artificial levees, again, just another barrier. We talked natural levees before where the river deposits just a little bit of a high spot right on the side of the channel, creating a little bit higher channel. Well, now we're going to take that to extreme and build even bigger sides to make it even a larger channel. Right? And of course, as we always talk about, the best way is not to build in these areas to restrict flood maintenance development. And that is the best solution, but often the very least employed. Now with these first four methods, there are two problems. The first one is the idea of complacency. And remember, we talked about this when we talked volcanoes. Complacency is the idea that you assume that the risk isn't nearly as high as the risk actually is. And this leads you to building in high risk areas. For volcanoes, you build right next to the slope of the volcano. For, you know, building a levee, right? Build right behind, build your house right behind the levee uh, because you think, oh, it's good, the levee's there, right? Well, as we saw in Katrina, that's not always the case, right? The other problem is this idea of self-perpetuation. And what I mean here is basically once you pop, you just can't stop, kind of like Lay's potato tree. Right. So if you install a levee, the town downstream, maybe it controls, you know, it takes this excess flood volume and flushes it downstream and your town doesn't flood, which is great. But now the town one downstream has not only their flood water to deal with, but your flood water. Well, what are they going to do? Build a levee. Now the stream down or the town down from them has their flood water, your flood water and their own flood water to deal with. What are they going to do? build a levee, right? Besides, right, levees need constant, constant modification, right? So again, more level, more levees means more water surface above the surrounding, means this water surface is above the surrounding floodplains, um, even at non-flood volume times. And what I mean is, is kind of this here. So here we see we're not in a, a flooding stage, right? Uh, we see a, a, a railroad track down here, and that would have been on the initial floodplain of the stream. And here we see the river now, it's, which has been channelized, uh, and by these natural or by these artificial levees here, right? Even though it's not raining, there's not a storm going on the level of the river is much farther, much higher than the floodplain itself. So even at non-flood volumes, now the water is, is running higher than it, than it should be. It should be running even with the floodplain, right? That means, uh, again, an artificial levy just means the channel can hold more water, right? This water moves downstream instead of flooding adjacent areas, and downstream communities experience greater flooding. This is going to kind of cause them to then build levees and do modification mitigation techniques, right? 
Here's uh, uh, some other problems associated with levees, but before I start talking about them and cover this all up, I want to show you here is one of the levees that broke in New Orleans uh, with Hurricane Katrina. And uh, over here, you'll notice on this side of the levee, and it's kind of hard to see how tall this levee is, but it's a, a huge, tall levee. You can see there's a car down there, so you can see really how tall this levee is, right? This side's okay. It didn't break over here. But over here, right, this is where the levee broke. You've now built your house in the back swamp. Now that it broke over here and has flooded this whole area, right, uh, there's a couple other issues that occur, right? Levees then prolong flooding by not allowing water to drain back. Once this, you know, f uh, recedes back below the, the area where it broke, all this water is just going to be trapped back here in this back swamp, right? Uh, again, a levee is, is, you know, it's still a tr stream channel. It still transports, moves, and deposits sediment, which means that the riverbed's going to rise, right? So when the riverbed rises, right, then the river itself rises, and we have the river running above the floodplain even at non-flood volumes. This means that they need constant modification to hold back the rising waters, and that these water surfaces, again, now instead of running even with the floodplain, they're above the floodplain, and nothing's even flooding, right? Uh, there's no, no uh, rain event occurring, right? So now we need to dredge them out so they can hold more water again, or modify them to be higher so they can hold more water, right? Constant modification. Here's another technique, channelization, the idea to deepen and straighten the channel. This one was done on the Kissimmee River. It did control flooding well, but it drained a lot of the wetlands, lowered plant and fish diversity, disturbed the hydrologic cycle. So there's definite downsides, and, and you can't do this everywhere either. Here's one of those retention basins or retaining ponds that I was talking about. As you can see, this is done on, on you know, kind of a property by property scale. Here we have where it drains excess water off the parking lots and building structures. And instead of draining that right into the local stream system, it drains into this settling pond or retention basin, which has extra volume capacity can store some of that extra water and then there'll be a pipe leading out of it and the size of that pipe dictates how much water can go out so it releases the water off these properties you know slower back into the stream system but this is again not a, a citywide or, or area-wide management plan this would just be a, a property by property the management plan uh, erosion control, this is what's called silt fence. It needs to be in place before you move any dirt on any construction site uh, via the Clean Water Act of 1970 or 72. Uh, and the idea here is that it allows water to pass through, it kind of filters it, but it keeps sediment uh, on the construction site from going into local drainage, sewer, stream system, and clogging them up, leading to potentially more greater flooding. Right? If you're one of these folks that's going to insist on living next to the river, right, in an area that's flooding very frequently, uh, one good thing to do is to uh, floodproof your house. Move all of your uh, appliances upstairs rather than having the washer, dryer, the heater, the furnace, all those in the basement. Have them upstairs so when it does flood, you don't destroy all of those appliances. Also, cut openings in your in your uh, uh, sub basement to to allow water to pass in why would you want water to get in because you want to even out the pressure you don't want all this extra water pressure on the outside of your foundation uh, it might crack your foundation if you let the water in then it kind of evens out the pressure even though it destroys all your family photos and everything right? And then another way to mitigate again is floodplain management, uh, zoning the floodplain, right? Allowing, you know, what we have is called the floodway, and this would be the the, the uh, area that uh, uh, normally floods, even during not really, you know, extensive floods. And then flood fringe, and this would be the areas that flood maybe only in, you know, those more extensive 100 or 500 year floods, right? And allowing, you know, certain buildings to be or not to be built in these areas. You know, maybe we don't want to put a chemical manufacturing plant uh, anywhere in the floodway, maybe not even in the flood fringe, right? Uh, then if it floods and all those chemicals get into the water, that kind of thing, right? I'm not going to play these for you folks, but there's a bunch of cool videos on flooding here. I do uh, hope you to decide to check some of them out. Uh, they give you an idea of why flooding uh, is the deadliest of all the deadly. And again, it can happen to almost anyone, almost anywhere at almost any time. All right, folks, we'll see you next time for the next chapter.